Thank you. Um, the final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6111 in the name of Alistair Allen on Western Isles Interconnector. The debate will uh, be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Alistair Allen to open the debate up to seven minutes, please, Mr Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by thanking members who signed the motion, which forms uh, this evening's debate. I appreciate that at first glance this may appear as a niche or island-centric topic. Uh, if it is, I offer little by way of apology for that. Uh, the question of whether the Western Isles Interconnector goes ahead, however, uh, will in fact have a profound impact on Scotland's ability to reach net zero and to play our part in the global fight against climate change. I should also begin by recognising the wider area of support that this project attracts. Locally, it is an issue uh, which has the backing of MP, MSP and local authority, uh, and the Scottish Government played has an important role over the years in, to try in trying to move this on. All of the parties represented in this chamber uh, can justifiably uh, claim to have played some role in supporting it, and I very much hope uh, that we, we will be able to hear some of that tonight. Uh, most importantly, the need for the interconnector is recognised and accepted by the communities I represent. The lighthouse at the Butt of Lewis has a mention in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the windiest place in the UK. Uh, and for generations, the wind in Scotland was something to be endured rather than harnessed. Now, with the renewables revolution, we have a huge development opportunity right on our doorstep. Renewable developments are capable of bringing substantial socio-economic benefits to the islands, uh, and that is something we desperately need. The islands I represent are, by and large, economically fragile. The industries that we have traditionally relied on, such as textiles, fishing and crofting, have faced challenges in recent decades, and the public sector is by far the largest employer, uh, leaving us vulnerable uh, through uh, prolonged periods of UK austerity, such as the one uh, we are living through just now. The greatest challenge we face in the coming years is tackling the dual problems of depopulation and an ageing population. So the construction of a transmission link would unlock hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment from shovel-ready renewables projects across the islands. It is anticipated that a sizeable number of jobs and millions of pounds worth of contracts for the local economy would be created during the construction phase. The community benefit funds which developers have pledged to establish would also bring in much needed revenue. It is worth noting that the Western Isles are at the forefront of Scotland's drive to empower communities and enable them to make decisions about their own areas. Community-owned land covers nearly half the, island area, half the land area and contains 70 per cent of our population. Community trusts have a key part to play in building stronger and more sustainable communities, and many have done so by establishing their own renewable projects. Indeed, community energy in the Western Isles has thrived. Substantial sums of money are brought directly into the community every year for important projects dealing with issues such as fuel poverty, housing, employment and additional community services. So, presiding officer, there is a real need for an interconnector. The history of the project stretches back nearly two decades, and there is, you will be glad to know, not enough time tonight for me to cover that whole story but there have been many false dawns and broken promises. When there has been progress, it has felt painfully slow. Uh, one step forward has always seemed to proceed at least one back. In recent years, uh, with the Scottish Government's support, um, there has felt like momentum uh, on this issue, and it has been going in the right direction. In 2017, uh, the UK Government uh, reintroduced support for remote island wind and 400 megawatts of onshore wind in the Western Isles secured support through the contracts for difference auctions in the 2019 and 2022 rounds. However, in 2019, Ofgem rejected SSEN's proposal for a 600 megawatt link, instead proposing a smaller 450 megawatt connection that would have made projects unviable for developers. For the sake of a cost difference of less than 5 per cent, the larger link was rejected. The need for enhanced grid infrastructure for the Scotland offshore developments has breathed new life into the case for the interconnector, of course. SSEN has been developing plans for a substantially bigger uh, 1.8 gigawatt link 
and this would have sufficient uh, capacity to accommodate all currently contracted onshore wind sites uh, in the Western Isles and those offshore wind in the proximity to the Western Isles with additional headroom, hopefully, for future projects. But all of that brings us to the latest point in the saga and the real reason for tonight's debate. In August, Ofgem consulted on how it could support the accelerated delivery of strategic el electricity transmission network upgrades needed to meet the UK Government's 2030 renewable electricity generation ambitions. Despite the uh, 1.8 gigawatt transmission link meeting all of the criteria, it was omitted from the consultation document's list of projects, meaning investment in the project continues to be stalled. Presiding officer, I believe this is a project of national significance. I believe that the Western Isles has an enormous role to play in Scotland's renewable landscape in the coming decades. And I believe that the Western Isles transmission link is urgently needed to unlock that potential. However, I do not believe um, that those with the power to do that unlocking in Ofgem and the UK Government have treated this issue accordingly. Ofgem has a chance to change that by ensuring the Western Isles transmission link is included in its final list of projects approved for accelerated investment to be published at the end of this year. I hope members will join me in calling on them <coughs> to do just that. Thank you, Dr Allen. I now call Emma Roddick to be followed by Donald Cameron. Around four minutes, please, Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My colleague Alistair Allen has my complete support in, in seeking a new interconnector for the Western Isles, uh, one of many actions that the Ofgem needs to take but isn't yet taking to serve our constituents to even the most minimal standard. And I appreciate his comments around the, the perception of this being a, a niche issue, but actually he and I both know that it's, it's one of many indications of an ever-present and increasingly serious issue that has wide-reaching consequences. Since being elected last May, I've spent a considerable amount of my time being concerned and frustrated by failures in UK energy policy. There is massive potential in my region, all sorts of potential really, but I'm, I'm referring specifically to renewable energy potential this evening. Um, but UK energy policy continues to disadvantage the Highlands and Islands. It penalises us for providing clean, green energy to the rest of the country, charges, charges us more for the energy we use, with Ofgem even implementing as yet unexplained higher standing charges to my constituents. It does not make sense to leave our islands behind if the goal is to tackle climate change. My region is leading the way in innovation and in community solutions to energy concerns. Earlier this year, I was honoured to host the University of the Highlands and Islands here in the Parliament for an event about the research in energy that is happening within the uni. Developing our region, which is a region rich in natural resources for the better, requires being up close and familiar and really understanding what its potential means to our people personally, as well as how policy will ensure or jeopardise the continued existence of rural and island communities. So it's really hard to overstate the importance of a, a university that has skin in the game, taking the lead on bringing us into a future where we can lead not only in Scotland, but globally on tidal wind and wave energy technologies. Our unique environment deserves nothing less than those not only willing, but excited to research where the resource is. That knowledge can then be shared, and as we've seen from international interest in the UHI's work, people are screaming out across the world for the lessons that only the Highlands and Islands can teach. The unfairness is often raised by my constituents of their being surrounded by green energy development but facing insurmountable fuel bills, being forced into poverty or away from their home. It's a fair question and it's another that UHI research will be key to answering if and when the powers needed to make changes to energy policy are given to Scotland. Investigations into how communities perceive renewable projects as well as exploring community benefit that could be gained through local projects provide the fundamentals to ensuring that we can build a system that means the benefit of the work that is being done and the energy which is being generated in the region is felt in the region. And as SNP MP Stephen Flynn said, we have the energy, we need the power. It is unforgivable that the Tory UK government is preventing us from reaching our massive potential, instead frequently leaving many of my constituents in fuel poverty. We need powers over energy policy here and full powers over social security, but it's pretty clear that the UK government does not want to give us this, so we need independence. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms Roddy. I now call Donald Cameron to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Around four minutes, please, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I refer to uh, renewable energy in my register of interest? And can I also apologise uh, to you for having to leave the debate uh, early uh, this evening? Um, I welcome the opportunity to contribute uh, this evening. Um, and can I put on record my continued support for the Western Isles' bid to secure a subsea interconnector cable. And I thank Alistair Allen for bringing this debate to the Chamber. I'm always keen to take part in niche island debates, debates uh, and this is one of them. Um, having made representations on this issue in one form or another since I was first elected in 2016, I know there is widespread support, as he said. And can I acknowledge the cross-party support uh, for the interconnector, uh, which he mentioned? And I share his frustrations that we are still talking about the interconnector rather than seeing its delivery. It is, as Alistair uh, Allen said, a saga. It was deeply disappointing when Ofgem rejected the initial proposal for a 600 megawatt transmission link back in 2019. And I, that said, I welcome the fact that the latest proposal trebles the capacity of the link to 1.8 gigawatts and that the National Grid Electricity System Operator Report has assessed this project as, quote, essential and, quote, required to deliver 2030 offshore wind targets. And in April, the UK government announced a boost to the UK's previous target to deliver up to 40 gigawatts of offshore wind to delivering 50 gigawatts by 2030. And these are positive developments. But I also acknowledge that Ofgem, uh, once again, uh, is the issue, having failed to include the proposals in its recent consultation on accelerating onshore electricity transmission. Ofgem is, of course, independent of the UK government, and it is Ofgem, I believe, not the UK government that is the subject of frustration. And it is very regrettable they rejected that proposal in 2019. And there was, as Alistair Allen mentioned, a specific manifesto commitment from my party in 2017 to support the development of wind projects in the remote islands of Scotland, where they will directly benefit local uh, communities. Given the uh, current cost of living crisis, the global fluctuations in the energy market, and ongoing instability in Russia and elsewhere. It's imperative that we uh, in Scotland and the United Kingdom continue to drive towards energy independence. Uh, projects like the 1.8 gigawatt, gigawatt transmission link to the Western Isles uh, will unlock a significant amount of grid capacity as well as reducing our reliance on fossil fuels for energy. Crucially though, any new wind project, whether onshore or offshore, has to have community backing and result in long-standing benefits for people who live uh, in the Western Isles. Uh, and the various groups locally that I've spoken to during uh, visits to the Western Isles over the years have emphasised that point to me uh, clearly and consistently. Uh, in saying all of that, I know that support for an interconnector and the wind projects that come with that are not universally endorsed, and it would be wrong not to acknowledge that. And there have been just differences of opinion within crofting communities about the structure and arrangement of community benefits from renewable energy, and we must likewise uh, recognise that too. That's why I believe that in seeking to harness the untapped energy that the Western Isles can provide, uh, people on the ground must see the benefits of that through greater investment in local infrastructure and community projects. Deputy Presiding Officer, we all agree that there is a robust case for a new 1.8 gigawatt interconnector to connect the Western Isles, we must collectively make that case to Ofgem alongside community representatives to finally realising this long-standing ambition. And I too call on Ofgem to include this bid in its final list of projects for accelerated investments because of the benefits it will bring to the Western Isles, to Scotland and to the whole of the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cameron. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, around four minutes, please, Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as niche debates go, for someone from the south of Scotland, this is probably as niche as it gets. But I have to say that I intend to give this speech on behalf of my colleague, Rhoda Grant, who would have wished to be here, but due to circumstances, can't be. Can I congratulate Alistair Allen for securing this debate? And it's long been recognised that the West Niles have the ability to be a national source of renewable energy. The weather patterns make it so. However, we've been unable to source this energy because of grid restrictions. 
Ofgem wasted time arguing that Shettle's proposals for an interconnector was too large for what was required. They would only consent to an interconnector for any capacity which had already received planning permission. They refused to listen to arguments showing that if the interconnector was built with spare capacity, then that capacity would have been snapped up. The islands are made up of a large number of community-owned estates. These estates cannot afford to tie up capital for years in projects that might never come off. Therefore, their renewable energy ambitions are not yet going through the planning process and can't now without the guarantee of transmission. Yet if there was capacity in the grid, these groups would build onshore turbines, shovel-ready projects. Previously, Ofgem was insisting on a smaller capacity interconnector, which would have resulted in no community benefit. While we are having that argument with them, the Scott Wind leasing programme took place, leasing areas west of the islands for offshore wind. And now suddenly, there is another delay, because the proposed interconnector is deemed not big enough. This frustration. Ofgem have been told all of this previously, but would not listen. And now we are facing further delays and increasing costs. And meanwhile, it is the island community-owned estates that are being starved of much-needed income. Imagine what that investment would bring. It would be transformational to these local economies. But yet again, it appears that Ofgem only act in the interest of multinational energy companies and not the people who live and work on these islands. I welcome the commitment to an interconnector that is future-proofed, but regret that it has taken so long, has caused so much to play to get this in place. It is disappointing, therefore, that it is not included in the Accelerated Strategic Transmission Investment, the ASTI framework, the only link not included from the National Grid's ESO holistic network design. It is therefore critical that Ofgem change this position, ensure that the 1.8 gigawatt Western Isles link is included in Ofgem's ASTI framework decision due by the end of this year. We saw what happened when the subsea cable from Sky failed, meaning islands were dependent on diesel generators for electricity. More frustrating because our islands have the ability to remove carbon from the grid for everyone. I would urge the Scottish Government to use their very, very best efforts to progress this interconnector. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. And I now call Liam MacArthur uh, around four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start by declaring an interest as someone in receipt of feed-in tariff and uh, renewable heat uh, in incentive? And can I also pass on uh, my best wishes to my friend and our colleague, uh, Rhoda Grant? Um, also, can I thank Alistair Allen? Um, he knows that I stand shoulder to shoulder with him uh, on bringing any and all um, island issues to the Chamber. Um, the, the more niche, the better, I think, sometimes, although I think we are due a wrestle to the death over whether Orkney or the Western Isles is the windiest uh, of our islands. I, this is an issue that has been around for, for some time, and indeed it was with some trepidation I, I agreed um, to, to, to speak in the debate, as for some time it was seen as um, the Western Isles gain might be Orkney or Shetland's pain in the delivery of an interconnector. I think we're beyond that now. It's quite patently obvious, as, as Alistair Allen um, identified, that if we are to achieve our renewables and our net zero um, uh, targets, then it is going to require all of our islands um, to, to play their full potential uh, in delivery uh, of uh, renewables. But I think what we've, we've heard in relation to the, the, the story in relation to uh, the, uh, the, the Western Isles interconnector is reflected very much in the story um, that, uh, that surrounds uh, the attempts to get an interconnector in, in Orkney as well. Um, back in 2019, the, the needs case for a 220 kV um, uh, link was, was made. It was accepted by Ofgem, but only subject uh, to some fairly arbitrary uh, and, I think, pretty excessive uh, conditions. Uh, despite the needs case uh, or the cost-benefit analysis uh, from SSEN indicating that around about 70, 80 megawatts was required in order to, de to, to deliver um, the, uh, the, the, the cost-benefit um, required. Um, to justify that sort of investment. And nevertheless, Ofgem came back with a figure um, of around 135 megawatt, which, which seems to be excessively high. There was also a timetable, again, that, that seemed to be um, uh, far tighter uh, and more stringent than, than was necessary. That has been um, uh, elongated a little bit. Um, 
largely due to the restrictions imposed by, by COVID. But it does not suggest a, an approach that is encouraging, necessarily, of development of renewables in our, in our islands. And I think we quite rightly take pride in the world-leading legislation we have on, on climate change in this, in this Parliament. I think we are all um, seized of the, uh, of the fact that delivering of that is going to be far more difficult than the passing of the legislation. Uh, I think the fulfilling of our renewables potential, as I say, it can only be achieved by our uh, islands being able to play their full part, and that will require interconnectors of whatever happens in relation to storage and, de and development of other uh, technologies. And I think um, it is largely off Jim rather than the UK government that, that do need to, I think, reflect uh, far more. Yes, the, the, the cost of energy to consumer, yes, the security of supply, uh, but also um, how uh, integral this is to us achieving uh, our net zero targets. And, and, and that balance of the statutory duties on, on off Jim, I think, maybe needs uh, a bit of a refresh. I would caution uh, Emma Roddick uh, about drawing this into a debate around the Constitution. I do not think it is necessarily helped by the breakup of the UK or indeed the fragmentation of the energy market that not really anybody uh, within the energy sector is arguing, arguing for. I think there is cross-party support in the delivery not just of the uh, interconnector to the Western Isles but to all of our islands um, so that we can achieve our, our net zero targets, allow our islands to fulfil their potential. Uh, and I very much um, uh, hope and, and commit to play my part in continuing that cross-party consensus on this issue. And I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And I now call on Patrick Harvey, Minister, to respond to the debate on behalf of the Scottish Government. Brian Stiffenitz, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, if it is niche, uh, this debate is an extremely important niche. And I, even if not everyone is drawn to the slightly more technical aspects of a, an issue like this, the benefits of the realisation of the, uh, the project Alice Rallon is drawing our attention to will benefit huge numbers of people right across Scotland, but in particular in communities like those he represents. Scotland, of course, has a, a very long and positive history of harnessing renewable energy and our capacity to generate it is going to have to increase to meet our climate change targets. Increased electrification and deployment of renewables to meet expected growth in demand will require significant investment in our electricity infrastructure uh, to maintain resilience and to increase transfer capability between Scotland and the rest of the, the GB market, as well as meeting our own increased needs. Uh, and as, uh, as Liam MacArthur says, our island communities, including uh, those Alistair Allen represents, uh, have a critically important role to play in that. So, of course, we welcome the National Grid ESO inclusion of a new 1.8 gigawatt transmission line to connect the Western Isles in their Pathway to 2030 Holistic Network Design Report. And Alistair Allen, in bringing this motion to the Chamber, is quite right, as other members have done uh, across the Chamber, to highlight that expectations must now fall on Ofgem to ensure that this project does go ahead. The proposed line will accommodate the renewable energy generated from all known onshore and offshore wind in and around the Western Isles. That is a significant and very important step that will be key to enabling Scotland's transition to net zero, as well as supporting long-term energy security. We are well on the road to fully decarbonising our electricity system in Scotland, but it is vital that we continue to work together to enable all of these critical investments, while also making sure that regulatory levers continue to drive down costs and increase benefits for energy customers as well as for communities. We must not repeat the mistakes of the past. We must ensure a managed and fair transition to net zero. That is why we will work collaboratively with the regulator, with the UK government uh, and with communities and industry to secure that just transition, harnessing opportunities across all sectors to build a better and more equal Scotland. But we can only do this if the necessary infrastructure is in place to meet our growing renewable energy generating capacity. As we move, move toward a net zero society, the electrification of heat and transport will increase our demand for electricity. It is vital that this demand is met by renewables and flexible solutions rather than by fossil fuels and nuclear generation. Taking advantage of our extensive offshore wind resource will enable us to do that. 
uh, but there must be a means to transport that power to where it is needed. Heat in buildings, for example, accounts for 20 per cent of Scotland's greenhouse gas emissions, and the climate change plan envelope for uh, buildings and our heat in buildings strategy require over a million on-gas homes to convert to zero emissions of heat by the end of this decade, and for emissions from homes and buildings to fall by 68 per cent over the, the same time period. Now, I visited the Western Isles back in May, and I heard directly from people there about the challenges of decarbonising homes and buildings on the islands. Changing how we heat and use energy in our homes and buildings is fundamentally about addressing climate change, but it also can strengthen our energy security, and if we get the details right, it can represent a stepping stone toward not just a greener but a fairer Scotland for everyone. That is why we have committed to uh, continuing to make uh, our homes more energy efficient and decarbonise heat, with at least £1.8 billion being made available during the course uh, of this session of Parliament. Now, while the Scottish Government does not have the power to mandate community benefits, we do expect delivery partners of the transmission link to work with the local community and ensure that the community shares in the benefits of the project. Our seas are home to some of the best offshore wind resources in the world, and Scotland's ambition to capitalise on our offshore wind generation capacity is part of the bold action that we are taking to become a net zero society. I am aware that projects in Scottish waters are at a competitive disadvantage compared to projects further south as a result of the more challenging conditions and the higher transmission costs. We are actively engaged in the offshore transmission network review to consider how the offshore transmission network is designed and delivered here in Scotland. The decisions and actions that we take now will shape the Scotland that future generations will live and work in. Recognising the undeniable benefits to our economy, the Scottish Government has consistently provided a supportive environment for both off- and onshore wind uh, over the last decade. Scottish ministers made clear time and time again that we will use every lever at our disposal to maximise the wider economic returns from Scotland, uh, for, for Scotland from the wind sector. Scotwind is the world's largest commercial round for floating offshore wind and puts Scotland at the forefront of offshore wind development globally. And together with the uh, option fees for the clearing round, Scotland, Scotwind will deliver over £700 million in revenues to the public purse for these initial awards alone. Scottish ministers are considering how the Scotland revenue should be invested to maximise the benefits for people in Scotland. And in, in addition, Scotland will, will deliver several billion pounds more in rental revenues when projects become operational. And that, again, will be invested for the benefit of the people uh, of Scotland. I, uh, I give away. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. I, I don't want to enter a discordant uh, note, but I, I would simply observe that uh, in terms of commitments the Scottish Government have previously given to um, uh, seabed assets transfer, or the revenues from seabed as assets uh, transferring to local authorities, the exception to that at the moment appears to be Scotland, uh, and, the, uh, and the financial impact that is having on communities like Orkney is significant. And I would ask the Scottish Government to reflect on that. Minister. Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy, and I'm sure uh, fellow ministers will also be happy to explore those issues further with, uh, with Mr. MacArthur. But uh, uh, far from uh, sounding a discordant note, I hope that the whole chamber will recognise that Scotland does promise to be transformational in delivering economic supply chain benefits as well as that uh, huge uh, amount of renewable electricity generation. We welcome the commitment of developers to invest an average of £1.4 billion in Scotland per project. And that equates to more than £28 billion across the 20 Scotland offshore wind projects. And the two Scotland projects in close proximity to the Western Isles are no exception. The 1.8 gigawatt link makes, marks a major step forward uh, in unlocking the renewable potential of the islands. And while we share the disappointment that has been expressed about the delay uh, to the existing planned 600 megawatt interconnector, we welcome the news that the interconnector, now stated uh, as required by the network grid ESO, uh, will be significantly larger uh, than originally planned and will accommodate the energy generated from all known on and offshore wind in and around the Western Isles. We know that the timescale for these multi-million pound projects have slipped in the past, and the Scottish Government will continue to seek assurances that it will now progress swiftly and without further delay. 
Final investment will, of course, uh, be subject to uh, off-gem approval and necessary planning consent. So, just as Alistair Allen did in his opening speech, we continue to call on off-gem to ensure that the new 1.8 gigawatt interconnector is included in its final list of projects approved for accelerated developments. And we strongly encourage National Grid ESO to explore all avenues to accelerate the time timelines for our other Scotland projects. We are pleased that National Grid ESO has announced its intention to progress with a transmission entry capacity amnesty, which may help to free up transmission capacity, which is currently being held for some legacy projects that are not progressing. Scotland's long and positive association with renewables continues to go from strength to strength, and it is central to our green recovery. In 2021, Scotland generated enough renewable electricity to power all households in Scotland for almost three years. That's a huge achievement. So, in summary, Presiding Officer, we recognise the importance of energy generated in the Western Isles in contributing to the decarbonisation of Scotland's energy supply and contributing to our just transition toward net zero by 2045. We are pleased that the National Grid ESO uh, also recognised its importance, and we call on Ofgem to enable and ensure uh, this new 1.8 gigawatt link is included in its final list of projects for accelerated investment, so that this vital piece of work can be completed well ahead of our 2030 targets. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting.